إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون my brothers and sisters in Islam, we are in this beautiful time of year, this blessed month of Dhul Hijjah. And it is a time where the Prophet ﷺ has encouraged us to do more, to excel, to push ourselves stronger or harder towards trying to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And today's topic, I wanted to focus on the importance of submitting and sacrificing from our own selves for the sake of gaining nearness and the love and pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I saw some of last week's Jummah khutbah because alhamdulillah, it's actually recorded and placed up online. So our family members, those of us who fail to get home or fail to uh, teach our families when we get home what the Jummah Khutbah was about. You can now tell your spouse, go to Al Falah's website and you will be able to watch the Jummah Khutbah right there with crisp sound quality inshallah because there's a new camera that was installed. And so I managed to watch some of last week's Khutbah as well. And I got a gist of what was discussed. And subhanAllah, these are the blessed days of this month, right? Where the Prophet ﷺ tells us in a hadith, which is reported by Imam al-Bukhari, mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari, where the Prophet ﷺ says, مَا مِنْ أَيَّامِ الْعَمَلِ الصَّالِحِ فِيهَا أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْأَيَّامِ Now the Prophet ﷺ is referring to these days. These days of the month of Dhul Hijjah. And in fact, the ulama, the scholars mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ defines days here as the days, ayyam. And during the month of Ramadan, we, ble we, we are blessed with, with nights that get us extremely close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that are so beneficial for us, more beneficial than any other night of the year. But this month, we are blessed with the most beneficial days of the entire year. And we see that there are so many things that we can do to get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So before I talk about actually sacrificing from our own selves and our own desires, we will point out a few tips that you and I can implement in our lives. And we begin with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with regards to fasting. Now we know during the month of Ramadan, fasting is important. In fact, it's compulsory. And during this time of the year, the Prophet ﷺ would fast during the first nine days of Dhul Hijjah. Now we said that these are the most blessed days. These 10 days are the most blessed days. Why is it that the Prophet ﷺ only fasted nine? Why didn't he fast on the 10th day of Dhul Hijjah? Because that was the day or that is the day of Eid. And itself we will speak about insha'Allah ta'ala. So the Prophet ﷺ would single out times during the year other than Ramadan to fast, extra fasts. So we know that the three days in the middle of the month, Ayyam al bid right? The three days in the middle of the Islamic calendar's month were the days where the Prophet ﷺ would fast. We know that on Mondays and on Thursdays, the Prophet ﷺ would fast. And we also know that he would fast during these first nine days of Dhul Hijjah. 
Now, for some of us, we might find it difficult to fast nine days. For some people, they have medical conditions. For others, we're just not used to it. We don't feel that encouragement because it's not the month of Ramadan. Not everyone else around us is fasting. We are not going to the masjid for taraweeh. We are not having iftar together. We don't feel that encouragement, that push inside of us to actually fast those nine days. So the Prophet ﷺ shows us another example. For those from amongst us that want to fast, at least, the least that we can do is to fast on the ninth day of Dhul Hijjah, which will be next Wednesday insha'Allah ta'ala. The day before Eid. Eid has been announced as being on Thursday next week. So the day before Eid is the day of, uh, of Arafah. And for those who are standing in Arafah, those that have gone for Hajj, that you and I wish we could have been part of, but we were not selected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are given something absolutely great and powerful on that day. And it's a day where we fast for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the reward for that is the forgiveness of the sins that we've committed from the previous year, as well as the following year. Now when you do the math, you think, wow, MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, two years of sins being forgiven. And so some people are extremely wise, MashaAllah. They say, well, if I'm forgiven for two years of, of sins, then I will fast every second year. Because last year I fasted, so this year's sins were forgiven. And if I fast next year, then this following year, the sins will be forgiven. So I'll fast every second year, that means every year I'll be forgiven anyways. Why do I need two years of forgiveness? But you ask yourself, we ask ourselves, how many sins do we commit? So many sins that we can't even count. And look at how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. He gives us forgiveness for one year, and forgiveness of another year. And instead of us putting these two years together like this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to overlap our years. Forgiveness upon forgiveness, mercy upon mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isn't that a great sign of this, this creator of ours? Beautiful, beautiful, you know, amounts of, of mercy and forgiveness and rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we also see from the things that we can do. So we mentioned fasting the first nine days. We mentioned fasting only on the ninth day, right? Another thing that we can do insha'Allah ta'ala, which was a sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is to engage in extra takbirat. Those that went for hajj, what are they saying? Labbaik Allahumma labbaik. Right? They're getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the talbiyah. We can also do that. During these 10 days, it's encouraged that we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala much more. So we say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, constantly. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, it's reported that they would go out in the marketplaces, they would be walking in the streets, and they would be saying the talbiyah. And so for you and I, I know sometimes we feel shy to say this, but at least what we can do is whisper. The least that we can do is to whisper it, right? Whisper it to your own self that you can hear yourself asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, which is the next point I was going to make. You yourself can hear yourself praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can hear yourself saying, La ilaha illallah, testifying in the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next part was forgiveness, seeking forgiveness. And we notice on, on the day of Arafah, what is everyone doing? They're standing in the plains of Arafah and they're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. And in fact, this has become a business where people go for hajj and they say, or they send out a tweet, they send out a post, a Facebook post or a message to all their friends and family. If you want me to make dua for you, send me your name. So I will write it down on a list and I will make dua for you in Arafah. And some people actually charge to make this dua. Some people actually will charge you 25 cents, 50 cents, a dollar, five dollars, something simple and basic to make dua for you. And this is completely against our deen. The Prophet ﷺ encouraged us, you want forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you ask him for forgiveness. You be the one to ask for forgiveness. Why does someone else need to go to Arafah and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you? 
There's nothing wrong if you ask someone who's pious, someone who's righteous, someone who you feel is close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember me in your dua, generally, at any time. But to make these long lists and to post online and to ask people, send me your names and your numbers and I'll make dua for you, then I'll send you a message to remind you that I've made dua for you. There's so much more that we can do with our time. So much more that we can do instead of wasting that time, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during that time. The next thing that we can do, my brothers and sisters, in these 10 days of Dhul Hijjah is right after the Salah, right after Eid, right? Is to actually sacrifice an animal for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this sacrifice, we will talk more about it on the day of Eid, during the Eid khutbah insha'Allah ta'ala, the actual sacrifice and the, the wisdom and the hikmah behind the sacrifice and why we even sacrifice an animal. But we notice that through the sacrificing of an animal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for those who sacrifice an animal, Allah will give you forgiveness of a sin for every single hair or strand of fur that is on the animal that you sacrifice. Now we mentioned forgiveness upon forgiveness. One year of forgiveness on top of another, another year of forgiveness. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing more mercy towards us. You want to receive blessings here for every single strand of fur. And imagine how much hair is on our heads. Even for some of us that are, that are bald or have gone bald, we still can't count the amount of hair that's still left on the back and the sides of our heads. Imagine an entire sheep, an entire goat, or you take part in a share of a camel or a cow, and you sacrifice this animal for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every strand of fur is forgiveness from a sin that we've committed in our lives. And you do this every year. Imagine if you do this every year. How merciful is our Creator? And the last tip that I want to point out to my brothers and sisters is to actually come for the Eid prayer. I know for some in our communities, it's still very difficult for them to go to their boss, to go to, the, to their employer and to tell them, I need a day off. I have to have a day off so that I can go and fulfill my religious requirements to go and to pray the Eid prayer. And so it's encouraged that we all do this from now. And if you have difficulty, you have a hard time, come to us. Let us know that you're having a hard time. If you need a letter, we will provide you with something to let your employer know, or we will try and make an arrangement to speak to them and to clarify that yourself as well as the other Muslims that work with you need this time to go to pray. On Fridays, they need the time to go and to pray. And so we're there for you. This is what we do. We help the communities. We want to help each other so that each other can help the other. And so subhanAllah, those that are having a difficult time to come and to show unity, to be with the rest of your Muslim brothers and sisters, to show the entire society within Canada that this is what we do. And we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day. And on this day, we make it known to all of you. And this is our method. Then subhanAllah, let's try to help each other so we can help the other. Insha'Allah ta'ala. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah. Fastaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين وأصلي وأسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد عليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد My brothers and sisters in Islam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights for us the story of the building of the Kaaba the story of Ismail and his father Ibrahim عليهم السلام when they're building the Kaaba, and he says in Surah Al Baqarah, "Wa idh yarfa'u Ibrahim al Qawaid min al Bayt wa Ismail, Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sami'u al Alim." So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa taala shows us that Ibrahim and Ismail alayhim as salam. Prophet and his son, who is later to become a prophet, they take part in building the Kaaba together and putting this house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together. 
But in the next verse, and this is the verse that I actually want to focus on, the verse we recited is just showing us that they stood there, built the Kaaba, and then they stood in front of it and they made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the next verse, we see how they made dua for me and you. How they made dua for you and I. How they made dua for each and every one of us, for our family members, for our children, for our parents, for our great-great-grandparents, for our great-great-grandchildren. Those that remain upon Iman and Islam, they made dua for us. And so our father, or great-great-grandfather, you could say, the Prophet Ibrahim and his son Ismail alayhim as they remembered us in their dua when they said, رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ وَأَرِنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ So they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their dua and they say, رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ Make us from amongst those who are Muslim, as in we submit to you. And from those who will come from us, which is you and I, who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the time of the year where we submit. We submit in many different ways. And you think of the sacrifice of Ibrahim and Ismail in that action of actually, and we'll discuss it next week during the, during the Eid khutbah, of sacrificing your own child for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we know that Ibrahim didn't sacrifice Ismail, but he was given the command to do so. He saw it in his dream. And so subhanAllah, he goes to his son and he asks his son, you know, Allah had asked me to do something, do you submit to this? And he submits without even knowing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requests from his father. He submits fully and wholeheartedly. And so for you and I, we can see some points that happen for those that go for hajj. People who leave and have gone for hajj, they're not with us right now. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep them safe and protect them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow them to be forgiven and to accept their hajj and their efforts and their dua. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for them to return to us with a clean slate, as though they were born just today. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow them to return with health and with dignity. We see that for them, they have the ability to stand in Arafah. الوقوف بعرفة To stand in عرفة And for me and you, we wish that we can be there on عرفة, right? We wish that we can stand in عرفة. I know for many people, I've seen it and witnessed it with my own eyes. When the tents are there to shade you under the sun that's blazing hot, people go to Hajj and on the day of عرفة, they don't care. Even if they pass out, they want to stand under the sun. They don't want to be under the tent. They want to feel that exertion inside of their bodies. They want to feel the sweat. They want to feel the pain. They want to feel the burning heat on their skin. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one day might have the sun right above their heads. And they're wishing that they had this opportunity to ask for forgiveness. But now they have it and they will be there in Arafah. But we won't get that. But we can still stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can stop all of the nonsense that we were doing. And we can submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though we didn't go for hajj. We are right here in Oakville, in Mississauga, right? In the GTA. But we're submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of Arafah, before it and after it. We notice that for some they feel, you know what, I wish I can sleep in Muzdalifa. I wish I could just lay down on the ground, on the sand, on those rocks, on the gravel, and just sleep there in the middle of the desert. I wish that I can go for hajj. I wish that I can be from amongst those. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you a nice beautiful bed. He gave you a nice beautiful pillow maybe. A nice you know, down comforter where you can cover yourself and sleep comfortably. Yet you can still wake up in the middle of the night, whether it's the night of Muzdalifa or any other night of the year. And you can still get up from your sleep and pray, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
sacrifice from the softness of the, of the mattress and the pillow and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also notice for those that will sacrifice an animal, right? Some will complain or some will feel sad within themselves that I want to sacrifice an animal, but I can't afford it. Some of the students as well, they say, I want to sacrifice an animal, but I can't afford it. Some parents, they might feel, you know what, subhanAllah, I can't afford it. I've got, I have so much uh, debt and I have so much on, on, on my mind and I'm not making enough money and I can't afford to sacrifice an animal. Sacrifice your desires. Sacrifice your desires. Sacrifice what you feel is taking you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we notice this subhanAllah as parents, and I saw this as I was driving, in, driving here, driving in for Jumu'ah. I noticed at the corner of Aaron Mills in Eglinton, there was a family that was standing there, the mother and the children. And sometimes you can learn from others about your own self. I noticed that they were standing there, the children waiting for the mother, to cross the street, but she's too busy sending messages on her smartphone. And so we can sacrifice from our desires to get closer to our children who are the most beloved to us. If we were tested with the test of Ibrahim and Ismail, if Allah commanded us to sacrifice our child, we would probably not be able to submit to this. But Ibrahim submitted and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected Ismail. He was not sacrificed. But for some of us, we actually do sacrifice our children. We sacrifice our time or our children's time for our phone. We sacrifice our children's first step for our phone. We sacrifice our children's first words for our phone. We sacrifice all the things that are happening inside of our households, whether it's our children or our spouse or our parents or our relatives or our friends. We sacrifice every beautiful aspect of their life for our phone. And we need to start sacrificing our phone for the rest of the list that we just mentioned. Sacrifice from what we desire. Sacrifice what has taken control of our lives. Give it up for a day and see how calm and peaceful you are. Turn it off, literally, turn it off. Leave it at home and go to work. The boss says, I've been messaging you. Say, you know what? Next time just call my desk. The boss says, how come I couldn't get in touch with you? Say, you know what? I actually have to pay more car insurance because I have a data package on my phone. So the insurance costs more. And I know this because I was calling car insurance yesterday. And so subhanAllah, we have been taken hostage by our phones. It's time that we are taken hostage with the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we submit to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do and how He wants us to live. My brothers and sisters, one last point before we conclude. For many of us, we wish and desire and cry tears and weep literally saying, I wish I can go for hajj. I wish I can see the Kaaba. I wish I can make tawaf. I wish I could see that, that, you know, that black structure or that structure covered in the black drape, the kiswa, that is known as the Kaaba. I wish I could go there. I wish I could make tawaf. I wish I can go and pray in front of the Kaaba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your wishing is good. But if your wishing is taking away from you actually worshiping Allah here and now, then stop wishing and start worshiping. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need us to go to the Kaaba in order to pray and to make dua and to recite Quran. We can do that right here. And as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentions to us, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closer to us than our own jugular vein. And so when we wish that we can go to the Kaaba to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, it's a desire we should all have without doubt, and we should try to get there. We should do as much as we can to get there. But know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears us right here and right now. Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to call out to Him right here and right now. He doesn't want us to simply come to Arafah, come to Muzdalifah, come to the Kaaba and make dua over there. And then we come home and we show everyone. And in fact, before we even come home, we go to the Kaaba and everyone is walking around the Kaaba. Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, sending pictures out to the rest of the world. Look where I am. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. 
What did you go there for? What did you wish to go there for? To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You get there and all you can do is take pictures and send messages back home and to the rest of the world. And then we notice when they come home, Alhamdulillah, I got to go for Hajj. Alhamdulillah, I got to go for Hajj. Alhamdulillah, I got to go for Hajj. It was so beautiful. Yeah, there were sacrifices. What are you doing now? What have you done since you've come back for Hajj? And so my brothers and sisters, I know all of us are here and we didn't go for Hajj. But this message needs to go to our family and relatives who are there now. Tell them, turn off your phones. If there's an emergency, you call us. If there's an emergency or an incident that happens, turn your phone on, let us know you're safe, turn your phone off. We'll be okay, we'll be happy. No news is good news. And so subhanAllah, we realize that we have lost the essence of our deen and lost the, ens the essence of getting nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We conclude by sending peace and blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his angels do as mentioned in the Quran inna allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala al-nabi ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli wa sallim mubarak ala sayyidina wa nabina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us during these days we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive all our family members and accept their hajj and their efforts that they've gone for. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow all those that have gone for hajj to return safely to their families. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all the ability to go for hajj so that our hearts are soothed and calm and peaceful. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect each and every one of us living on the face of the earth wherever we are. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for all of our brothers and sisters in the deen as well as in humanity that are suffering, that are being oppressed. Ya Allah, please save them and help them and make it easy for them and provide for them a way out. إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله يذكركم ودعوه يستجب لكم ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة